In this module, we're going to be taking a look at the different kinds of servers that you have available to use for your, your Hadoop cluster. So all these servers that are part of an Elastic MapReduce cluster are based on EC2 instance types. And you've got 11 different types to choose from. There's a list of them available online at aws.amazon.com EC2 instance types. Let's go take a look at those 11 right now that we previously uh, saw when we were defining a job in the previous module. Now, If you remember back when we were creating our job in the previous module, we got to this screen here where we were creating a new job flow. And At this point we had the ability to choose what type of instance we wanted for both the master and the slaves. And here, if you click on this pop-up list, you see those 11 different types of instances that I said we had available to choose from among all the different types of EC2 servers. And you can pick the instance type for your master separate from the instance type for your slaves, just like with a regular Hadoop cluster. In that pop-up list, you saw that every instance type had two names. The first name is sort of the friendly name, the regular name, and then in parentheses it has the API name, which is what you use when you're using things like the command line tools to define what instance types you want to use. Every single instance type has a number of attributes. The most critical ones are going to be how much memory, how many CPUs, and how much storage. There's a couple others as well, like the performance of the I.O. subsystem. Now these servers typically aren't physical servers. They're, they're virtualized servers. The uh, Amazon uses Zen virtualization. And because of that, as I mentioned previously, uh, a server that you're using, a virtualized server, can run slower than others because other processes on that same physical server are taking up more of the time. Now if we take a look at a typical uh, instance here like M1 large, it's running uh, Debian uh, distribution on top of Linux and every one of these servers has some number of virtual cores and you also see things uh, described in terms of EC2 compute units. So EC2 compute units are how Amazon tries to give you some idea of the relative performance of these different types of servers. So they arbitrarily said one compute unit is about the same as a single Xeon processor that's running at one gigahertz. So if you have a virtual server that's got two cores, and each one of those cores has 3.25 EC2 compute units, then you wind up with six and a half compute units. Now every instance has a price uh, measured in terms of hourly usage. It's a step function, so as soon as you start using an instance for part of an hour, you're paying for that full hour. And then when you get into the next hour, you start immediately you're charged for that next hour. And the price is a combination of a base price, which is um, the same as your EC2 cost, and then an extra price that Amazon adds uh, because you're using Elastic MapReduce. And typically that extra that is added for Elastic MapReduce is about 20%. So for example, um, if you had an M1 small, the base price in EC2 is 8.5 cents per hour. Amazon adds another 1.5 cents per hour, so the total price comes to 10 cents an hour. If you've got an M1 large, the base price is around 32 cents per hour, so you wind up paying, when you add in the Elastic MapReduce overhead, 40 cents an hour. There's another thing called spot pricing that we'll talk about later, where the price of the server hour is based on how much demand there is for that instance, that instance type. And by using spot price, you can significantly reduce the total cost for running a job. However, as we'll talk about in depth later, one of the issues with spot pricing is you make a bid, and if the spot price ever exceeds your bid, then those servers instantly disappear. The M1 large instance type is one of the most common types people use for Hadoop clusters, so we're going to talk about it in a little more depth here. It's got 7.5 gigs of memory with two virtual cores. Uh, it's a 64-bit platform. And the default Hadoop configuration uh, is to have four mappers and two reducers running in parallel, each with 1.6 gigabytes of memory for the JVM. 
And if you think about it, that's kind of interesting because 6 times 1.6 is more than 7.5 gigabytes. And that's why this configuration, if you're running jobs where the jobs actually use all the memory in their map and reduce tasks, then you're going to want to use the high memory bootstrap action to change the configuration so that you're not going to run out of memory. So I've set up a cluster and which uses M1 smalls, uh, sorry, M1 larges for these slaves. And I'm going to log into that cluster and we'll take a look at uh, more of the settings in detail. I've logged into the slave in a cluster I've set up, which is using M1 large instances for the slaves. And from here, we can take a look at what the server really looks like. So if I run the top command, you'll see here that I've got basically that 7.5 gigabytes of memory. Interesting, no swap. Now, typically, I always run with swap uh, on. And in fact, later, I'll show you how to use a bootstrap action script to turn on swap for these servers. If I show how many CPUs, you can see there's two of them. So as I mentioned, there's two virtual cores here. Now, if we take a look at the disk drives, you can see there's two of them here that actually have any capacity. These are these two 400 gigabyte drives under mount and mount one. And what's interesting is, so I'm logged in here as the Hadoop user, which means I'm at home Hadoop. If I take a look at what's in this directory, you can see this is actually the Hadoop home directory. So in here, we've got all of the jars. We've got the Hadoop bin and we've got the Hadoop conf. So let's go take a look at what's inside of Hadoop conf. Here it's got all the standard uh, XML configuration files. So let's go take a look at the MapRed configuration file. Now in here, you can see uh, we've got our IO sort MB value of 200. This is where it's configuring the child JVM options uh, to set up a 1.6 gigabyte uh, JVM. Interesting here, regular output from your job would be compressed using gzip. And by default, it's set up to compress map output using LZO. Now here also a uh, couple other interesting things. Speculative execution is turned on. And in general, that's a good idea with clusters of servers running in EC2 because potentially since many of these are virtualized, your server, one of your servers might be running a lot slower than the others. And so in this case, speculative execution can be a win. Here's where it's setting up the maximum number of map tasks per server to be four. And you can see that the maximum number of reduced tasks per server is set to two. So what's a typical configuration? Usually, unless you're running lots of servers or some significant number, number of extra high capacity servers, you can use an M1 small for the master. Just because, you know, the name node and the job tracker, they don't need a lot of memory, they don't need a lot of compute power. So, uh, for example, if I'm running a cluster with a bunch of M1 smalls as the slaves, I can go up to about 50 slaves, somewhere between 30 and 50 slaves, before the master has to get bumped up from an M1 small to an M1 large. For typical jobs, like your average Hadoop job, the M1 large is a good machine for the slaves. It has reasonable I.O. performance, you know, reasonable CPU capacity, etc. If you have a cluster where the servers are spending most of their time waiting for something externally, for example, web crawling, in that case, you might as well use M1 smalls because they're not going to be CPU bound. And this gives you essentially a higher performance for your dollar spent. The downside to M1 smalls is that they have pretty painfully slow disk IO performance and the CPU, all, CPU is also very limited. So if, for example, you're not just using the cluster to, to fetch web pages, but you're also using that same cluster to do parsing, now suddenly the fact that the CPU is so uh, lame, now the fact that the CPU is so limited means that you're no longer going to get that performance win and you'd probably want to switch to an M1 large instance type. Now at the extreme other end of server classes would be the com cluster compute instances. So there are two of these to choose from. These have lots of cores and a key point is they have much faster network. So regular instances are connected via one gigabit ethernet, but these cluster compute instances use 10 gigabit ethernet. 
So lots of cores, faster network. What are they good for? Well, any kind of job where you're doing a lot of parsing, uh, things like machine learning, these are all typically very CPU bound. Also, if there's a lot of data going between your map and reduce phase, then the faster network um, is going to be a lot better for you. So for an example, there's the Cluster Compute 8 Extra Large Instance, or CC2.8x large. And this has got 60 gigs of memory and eight real cores, which translates into 88 compute units. Uh, and it's got a pretty big hard disk drive, 3.3 terabytes. So the combination means that often, for certain kinds of jobs, it's both faster and more cost effective to use a few of these types of instances, for example, eight of these, versus maybe a hundred of the M1 larges.